Well, thank you again for coming out on the second warm evening as we open up the scriptures uh, concerning the things of the prophetic. Um, been blessed by many. Um, the teaching only went up on the web yesterday. Um, I know some of the churches were already listened in. Other people have texted me and emailed me. So uh, God is speaking through our house here, and I'm re- incredibly grateful for that and humbled by it. I just want to pray, and then we'll just get straight into the word. Father, I just want to thank you again tonight for your incredible grace in using each and every one of us. And Lord, I just pray that you tune our ears tonight, Lord Jesus, to hear what you have to say. Sometimes we come and we we don't fully grasp what you're ministering to into our hearts. But tonight, I just pray that as we leave this place tonight, that every one of us will just have that clear impression. And just know that we know that we know that you have spoken into our hearts and into our lives and into our ministries. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. As we said last week, uh, I've said on numerous occasions now, um, I desire more of God. I desire God to speak to me and through me. But one of the things that I can't have here at a church is a three ring circus, that we have to get these things right and do things properly and in order. And we want God to move. And uh, we want his presence and we want his voice. Uh, but we also want to obey his word and get things right, don't we? And um, I'll just open this up in a similar vein to last week. Um, the scripture that really has been, I guess, the mantra for my life since the age of 15 is this, my sheep hear my voice. I've never ever under any illusions that it's Claire on the phone. Do, do you know why? If you're married to somebody, have you ever picked up your mobile and, and, and they, you didn't even look at the number? But they didn't need to say anything, just the first one second. You knew it was them. And I think that's how God wants it to be with us. I think sometimes we've kind of not really been as in tune as we might have been. But God clearly wants to speak to us. And if tonight's uh, session is about this, God speaking to us. We'll get to God speaking through us in September, but tonight is about God speaking to us. 1 Corinthians 14, the one who prophesies strengthens others and encourages them and comforts them. I don't intend to do a huge recap from last week, but we did look at the fact that in the Old Testament there were prophets, priests and kings and the the prophets were mediators between God and his people. They were the ones that were the voice of the Lord to the people of the Lord. Aren't you glad we don't live in those days? We live in the days where we believe in the Reformation, we believe in the priesthood of all believers where we believe that the smallest baby Christian can hear the voice of God. And that's incredibly important. It has to be the foundation for our living. I said last week, Chris encouraged me when we were talking about discipling and training new Christians, let's not just teach them the Bible, that's an imperative. And, uh, but let's teach them how to pray, because in teaching people how to pray, we engage them with God. And uh, the whole of our experience should not just be head knowledge. It's got to be relationship-based. We have to be those that are in love with Jesus and hear his voice. And when that happens, things change. You can all prophesy, Paul says, one by one, so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. Just pop that uh, next slide up, will you? And this is what we looked at last week. Just the whole essence of edification to build people up, to exhortation to call people near and to comfort, to cheer people up. So what we said last week is when we're hearing God's voice for ourselves and for others, that's the thing that should be clearly, that's the New Testament stuff, that's what we believe God is calling us to, to build people up, to call people near, to comfort them, to cheer them up. And if we can get that operating in every church in our nation, what a difference it would make. Most people don't come to church because they've been once and they didn't get that. They didn't get built up. They didn't get called near. They didn't get cheered up. And we want to be different. And they always say, not on my watch. We want something different. It's not about directing or correction. We talked about that last week. That's the job of the Ephesians 4 giftings. But each and every one of us can and should hear the voice of God and be able to do those things in the lives of other people. So we looked at the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament prophets and the gift of prophecy. But tonight, it's all about us individually hearing the voice of God. I think it's really, really important. I can't labour that strongly enough. 
I think it was probably at the age of 14 or 15 that I determined in my own heart, unless I could hear God for myself, then I truly wasn't a Christian. I don't know whether any of you kind of, that resonates with you, but I, I didn't want some kind of religion. I wanted that relationship with God. And I knew I was only tender, I knew I was only young, and I, I encourage my own kids and I encourage all of us and our young folk, especially as they go to Soul Survivor, pursue the voice of God in our hearts and in our lives. He wants to talk to us. He wants to have that relationship with us. So it's all about hearing God for ourselves. And uh, the first point I want to make, and it is a major point, because we get, sometimes we get all a bit upset and we put things in little boxes uh, so that we can't use them. We all want to be correct, but sometimes we box things up so we don't ever get to them. I think sometimes we forget that whatever God does in us and to us is all about his grace. The gifts of the Spirit, hearing his voice in our lives, are all to do with his grace, the grace gifts, aren't they? So sometimes, and I think we've all been here, we feel that people should be 100% theologically correct to operate in the gifts that God gives. Now that sounds really spiritual, but it's so wrong. Because none of us are 100% theologically correct, are we? I would hasten to say we've all got stuff to learn. So if we had to be 100% on the button with absolutely anything, none of us would ever enter into the gifts, not just the gifts that we think about as being spiritual gifts, but any of the gifts that God has placed upon our lives to use for the extension of his kingdom. None of us would ever use them. It's all to do with his grace. And equally, I think as well, we have this belief that people have got to be morally faultless to operate in the gifts that God gives them. And that true is not true either, is it? Because we've all fallen short. We all continue to fall short. It's all to do with the grace of God using us. We are just broken and marred vessels. If you want any proof text for that, the whole reason that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in the first place and began to teach them about spiritual gifts was they were excelling in the gifts, but they weren't so good theologically and morally, were they? There was a whole lot of stuff going on in that church that needed correction. I'm not saying that we should just let people live how they want to, but what I am saying is God uses us sometimes despite ourselves. And in his grace, he takes the broken and marred people we are and he speaks through us. And it's absolutely wonderful. When God speaks through me, he speaks in a black country accent. I'm always amazed by that. He, he takes the Steve that he knows better than anybody knows and all the broken things in my life and yet he uses me and he uses you. So I just want to encourage some of you because I think... Some of us have put a block in our spiritual progress by saying, I don't understand it all, and I'm not good enough. I think if we take some faith steps, God will fix those things in our lives. I think while we stay static, we just push back and uh, don't go where God wants us to go. So I really want to encourage you tonight. Let's not put these things in a box that says, they are for the super spiritual. Read 1 Corinthians at your leisure. And you'll find out, as Paul begins to teach, that church was in a great place in operating in the gifts, but not in such a great place around their theology and their morality. So it all sounds very reasonable, but let's be honest. Because what does the scripture say? We have this treasure in jars of clay. We're just broken pots, aren't we? Just broken pots. So we need to consider hearing God's voice and sharing it. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think when God speaks to us, especially for other people, we want to really understand everything that he said. So then we start to contaminate it, and God will whisper something else to encourage somebody else with, and then we'll start adding to it. And so let me just encourage you tonight, just listen to the voice of God and just tell it like it is. Whatever he prompts you to say to hurt somebody, whether it's taking their blood in hospital, or whether it's wherever we might find ourselves, in the school, if God gives you a little thing to say, just say it. I've often told this story, but when I went to Moray's church down in Neath in Wales, we had a powerful night of encounter, and there were 70 or 80 people come forward, and, and I, I managed, by the grace of God, gave most people a, a word from God. It was quite incredible. I think the meeting started at 5.30 in the evening, 
And I finally got into my car at 9.30 at night, and I finally got back about 1 o'clock in the morning. But the one thing that the whole church burst into laughter at, I didn't know what I was saying, and if I'd have tried to interpret it, it would never have, it would never have got past my lips. There was this one woman, and I just pointed out and said, look, I believe the Lord is saying to you, stop spinning the plates, stop spinning the plates. The whole church just burst into laughter. Apparently, every time she comes to church, and people say, how are you doing? She says, I'm just spinning the plates. Just spinning the plates. So we have to allow God to speak simply through us. We are marred and broken vessels. But isn't it wonderful that he takes us as we are, and by his grace, he pours stuff in us and out of us into other people. So I guess tonight, we have to address this, really. And we can have my next slide, please, and my final slide. How does God speak to us? How does God speak to us? Well, there are numerous ways in which God uh, speaks to us, and, you know, I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. God loves communicating to his children. The essence of that relationship right there in the garden, the whole essence of God's heart towards humanity, was that we had a relationship with God and him with us. And when, when Adam decided he was going to hide himself from God, God was pursuing him. He wanted to talk to him. Where is he? Where has he hidden himself? And all of the time, I believe God is communicating. There are times in the scriptures when you read stuff like visions were rare and infrequent in those days. I don't believe it was that God had stopped communicating. I just believed it was that people had got so hard-hearted, they stopped listening. I think right from day one, God has never, ever stopped speaking. I always find it funny when people say, I wonder what God is trying to say. God's never, not trying to say anything. He's saying it. The problem is on our part sometimes that we're hard of ears and hard of heart. So he loves to speak to us, and he speaks to us in a variety of ways as individuals. So, and these are all biblical, so you can get these down. He speaks to us in dreams, in visions, in pictures, in physical sensations, in impressions, in nature, and prophetic enactments. I'll get to that one at the end. That's quite an interesting one. But as mature believers tonight, the majority of us, I'm sure, I believe that God, at many times, and on an ongoing basis, speaks to each and every one of us. But I think it's essential that we kind of push in for more. And uh, you might say to me, Steve, well, actually, the way I hear God is by reading his word. Absolutely fantastic. We need to be those who base everything upon the word. I'm not saying that this is replacing God's word. God's word is final in our lives. But... You know what? Have you ever read the Word and still not heard God? I'm just trying to be honest now. Because you go read Leviticus for two hours, and uh, you might find yourself not hearing God at all. You might find yourself snoring, and uh, by the time you've gone through all the laws and stuff, it's that it's that relationship. The Bible, as in our prayer, is not some kind of monologue. It's a dialogue with God. So we have to allow the Scriptures to speak to us. Therefore, our ears have to be open, don't they, spiritually? And uh, I think I've spent time in the, in the Scriptures and read and read and read and then looked back and thought, what have I just read? I've been reading for 15 minutes now, couldn't remember a thing I'd read, didn't speak to me at all. Might as well have been reading the telephone directory. Really, really important. That's why Jesus says, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we need to, as people of God, Make it our business to hear God's voice. I, I really believe that with all of our hearts. What kind of marriage would it be if you never had any interaction, conversation with your wife? What kind of relationship would you have with your children if you never spoke to them and talked to them on a daily basis? Well, it's exactly the same with God. That is the longing of his heart that he might dialogue with us. He might whisper things into our hearts, share his secrets with us. It's really, really important. Once you get this, it will change the way that you live. We've talked very often and long in church about co-laboring with Christ. The whole point of that is that we're working with him and not for him. He's not barking directions through a megaphone from heaven. He's standing right next to us and he's guiding our hands and he's whispering into our hearts and he's showing us how. And I want to live more like that than the other way. I don't know about you, but that's exactly what's on my heart. And we need to develop an expectation that God will speak to us every day. And you know what? I think sometimes we just don't make time in our day for God to speak to us. I think we get so busy with things that we bark up to heaven a few prayers and then we get on with our busy lives. 
I think it's equally important for us to put some time in the day when we've spoken to God to allow him to speak afresh to us. It's very, very important. And uh, we need to, before you can ever speak to anybody else, anything that you believe God has, has given you for them, you've got to hear God's voice first, haven't you? You've got to share something that God has already given to you for them. So it's an absolute imperative. Now, most of my teaching over the last two years, if you've been here in church, you will know has been from the New Testament epistles, particularly those of Paul. And we started in the book of Romans and we've now nearly finished Ephesians. But as you will now know, the Apostle Paul was Mr. Bible College conservative. He wasn't your mad Peter who would uh, have a good go at anything. He was a very highly educated man. He understood theologically the concepts. He'd been schooled at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of his time. So theologically, he was absolutely sound. So if God spoke to him in different ways, don't you think that God wants to speak to us in different ways? So I'm just giving you that as an example. Paul, you would say he's not the most outrageous person in the whole of the scriptures. I just want to show you just one person that God continued to speak to. So here we go. Acts chapter 9 and verse 4. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him. That was right at his conversion. Right from the beginning, there was that interactive voice between Saul and God. God spoke to Paul. Acts chapter 13. During the night, Paul had a vision. There a man stood from Macedonia, pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Acts 17. One night, Paul, the Lord said to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid. Speak up and do not be silent. Acts 19.21. After these things were accomplished, Paul resolved in his spirit to go to Macedonia and Acacia and then go to Jerusalem. Then Acts 22.11, that night the Lord stood near and said, Keep up your courage, for just as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness to me in Rome. God was speaking into this apostle's life. Yes, he had the Old Testament. Yes, he had the Torah and the law. But that was an ongoing voice of God. And God revealed himself, as we've just seen, through visions, through dreams, through all sorts of things. And I think sometimes we've boxed God into a little box. And I'm sure tonight God wants to speak to us in many, many ways. And we just need to be open to that. So let me, let's look at the first couple of uh, things together. Dreams, visions, and pictures. Numbers 12 and verse 6. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance to the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward and he said, Hear my words. When, you are, when there are prophets among you, God will make himself known to them in visions and I will speak to them in dreams. I've been thinking about this a lot because I can't personally say, I don't think that I've had, I may have had one prophetic dream, maybe. That was last week, funny enough. I can't say that I've ever seen a vision, but sometimes I have seen a picture. Some of you, when we've been in our prayer meetings, have said, I believe the Lord showed me a picture of, and you begin to describe it. But you think about a dream. Uh, we've all had dreams, haven't we? Some of us have had nightmares. Plenty of us have had dreams. We've had too much cheese at night. But th those dreams tend to be all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Uh, you know, when you go and put your head on the pillow, all of a sudden, some of the weirdest things happen to you. Uh, I remember as a child in particular, the day before I used to go back to school, I used to, I used to have a dream that I, I went to school and I didn't have any shoes on. Did anybody have a weird dream like that? Or, or, or I'd left all my sandwiches at home and it was, it was so disturbing that I'd wake up. I think we've all had weird and wonderful dreams. These are not the dreams that the scriptures are talking about. As we said last week in the book of uh, Joel, there's a prophecy which Peter repeats and preaches on the day of Pentecost that our young men will see visions and our old men will dream dreams. I believe he's talking about God communicating to us. So when it's a dream of God, I believe that we'll know it's a dream from God. We won't have to make it up. Then there are visions. Exactly the same as a dream, but you're not asleep, you're awake. I can't ever say that I've had a vision. But I know people that have, that have seen something in the spirit while they've been awake. It's been technical or it's been, it's been all sorts of things happening and they've heard God speak to them very, very clearly. And as we, as we go through some scriptures here, you'll see time and time again, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God speaks through dreams and he speaks through visions. But he also speaks through images or pictures. And I can say on numerous occasions, I've seen something in my spirit and spoke it out 
and God's done something very uh, powerful with it. A couple of Sunday mornings ago, there was a young lady, and I won't go into any detail, but I, I gave her a, a picture of a, of a new chapter in a book, and the tears began to claw, claw down her face, and she shared some stuff after. God had clearly spoken to her. I had not got a clue what this new chapter meant. All I could see in my mind's eye was a book, but I knew God was saying, it's a fresh day, it's a new start. So I think God does sometimes give us those pictures. And sometimes we're a bit dismissive. Sometimes we think we've made it up. And I think we all need to get to the point, as I said earlier, that we know it's God that's speaking to us. Because sometimes it's our own imagination. Of course it is. Sometimes the enemy comes, doesn't he? But you know what? When Claire rings me up, I always know it's Claire. You're not going to fool me. I know it's her voice. You know why? Because I'm intimate with her, because I love her, because I've lived nearly 25 years with her. So I know her voice. And ladies and gentlemen, we've been in church a long time, many of us. We need to be assured of the voice of God in our own lives, don't we? We need to make sure that we know it's God that's speaking to us. So let me just give you a couple of Old and New Testament examples of each. Genesis 28, Jacob came to a certain place and stayed there for the night. Because the sun was setting, taking one of the stones, he placed it under his head and lay down in that place, and he dreamed that there was a ladder set up to the earth and the top of it reached the heavens and the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. This young man, twisting and turning, as I said to you before, if we've got to be theologically correct and moral 100% morally right for God to speak to us, he's not speaking to any of us. And this young man had deceived his family. He was running away on his mother's instructions to Uncle Laban's house. And God encounters him and speaks to him through this dream. Then you've got it in, in Matthew's Gospel, haven't you? Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another road. I want to make a point here, and I've never heard anybody say this before, but I think sometimes uh, some of the charismatic churches have gone overboard on visions and dreams. have gone too far in a bizarre sort of way. I've read some stuff in books about dream interpretation. I'm not into that, you know. Because every time I read in the scriptures, when God speaks to his people, he speaks really clearly. They're not worrying about what he's going to say. You never hear anybody in the, in the Bible saying uh, um, they woke up and they'd had a, a dream from the Lord of a toilet brush and they wondered what it was all about. You never get that, do you? Have you noticed that? He told the Magi, don't go back that same way. I want you to go a different route. Now, they, they understood what he was saying, didn't they? It wasn't... Now, there are times in the Bible where their dreams were quite confusing, but listen, they were always to the unbelievers. Do you remember Joseph having to interpret Pharaoh's dream? Pharaoh did not have a clue. You know why? Because he couldn't hear the voice of God. He needed a man of God to hear the voice of God. Exactly the same in Nebuchadnezzar. Read the scriptures. I believe if God is going to speak to you through a dream, you'll know it's God. So don't worry about it. You won't have to wake up and think, was that me? Was that God? Was that the devil? Because you know his voice, you'll know God spoke to you. Now, I'm not saying we all should have dreams, but I think some of us may have written off stuff that God was doing to us in the night and speaking to us in the night. I don't, I'm not sure. Then, then visions, Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. That's in the Old Testament, the New Testament. One afternoon, about three o'clock, Cornelius had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of the Lord coming down, saying to him, Cornelius. So although both occasions, again, men of God seeing something in the spirit that was completely clear and completely relevant. I don't go with this figurative, stupid stuff. I believe in the New Testament that God speaks very, very clearly. He always has done and he always will do. That is the era of grace that we talked about last week. I, 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 you know, people say, oh, the preacher said something and he prophesied this and it, it sounded very spiritual, but I hadn't got a clue what he was saying. Dismiss it. Because God is always clear when he speaks. I have never had God speak to me and not understood what he was saying. He doesn't want me confused. He doesn't want you confused. So if you have a vision of a lampshade and you don't know what it means and there's a banana sticking out the top. Just have a good think about it and say, was that me, was that God, or did I eat too much chocolate before I went to bed? 
And how about some pictures then? Amos 8 and verse 1. The Lord showed me a basket of summer fruit. It wasn't a vision. You had a picture. You could see this technical set of fruit. I spent some time with Marion this morning. He made me cry. Because only was such a lover of his garden. She said, uh, we're not going to have flowers on this coffee. And she says, we're going to have a, a spray of vegetables. Isn't that great? The Lord showed me a bunch of summer fruits. I had a wonderful picture when Marion said that of sprouts and carrots and so I've never seen a coffin that looks like that before. So we're, that's going to be a new experience here in church. But he sees this wonderful, wonderful thing, summer fruit. Acts 7 and verse 15. Look, he said, Stephen said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. I don't know whether this was an open vision or anything, but he said, look, I see it. I see it. God is showing me something. I see it. And, you know, biblical dreams and visions, I don't believe there should be any ambiguity. I believe that if God is speaking to us, then we will know God is speaking to us. So I'm not having weird and wonderful people come around here. There are some churches that are completely batty, and people say, I've had this dream of a crocodile and this, that. Well, if, if we know what it means, that's all well and good. But I don't believe God speaks in riddles, do you? He never spoke in riddles. When Jesus stood up, Jesus made everything incredibly plain and incredibly clear. He did speak in parables because he wanted to talk to his disciples. But there were parables, there weren't riddles. And you know what? The scripture always took time out to explain what those parables mean to us, the heirs of salvation. So that's dreams, visions and pictures. And then there's hearing God speak. And um, I believe God can speak to us audibly, although I've never heard his audible voice. But I have heard his voice. And so have many of you. And it's just been as clear as if God had spoken to you with an audible voice. You knew it was God. You felt it was God. And it was as clear as if I'm talking to you now. I've had that on so many occasions where I knew God was speaking to me. It was undeniable. That's the whole point of our Christian walk, isn't it? He spoke to me in complete sentences and complete words. It was unmistakable. And here's some Bible examples of, of, of people hearing God's voice. Little Samuel. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. There was a God encounter in that temple that day, wasn't there? Old Eli said, well, I can't hear God, but when God speaks to you again, tell him you're listening. Tell him you're listening. Whether God spoke audibly or what it was, uh, uh, the, the Spirit's voice into this little prophet's life, I do not know. But I do know that God spoke to him. And when his ears were open, he listened to what God had to say. And there was no ambiguity about what God was saying again. I feel like I really should labour that because I think many churches in, I call it Cara's magic, but right across our world right now, there are a lot of people in a whole lot of confusion. All these weird and wonderful visions and pictures and dreams. Listen, God is speaking clearly. God is speaking clearly. The scriptures are screaming out at us. These are the end days. We're about to see the most incredible move of God on the face of the earth. I have got no doubt about that. There are dark days coming upon the face of this earth. And, uh, but the, the Lord is going to break, break through absolutely certain but he's not making things all um, ambiguous well, oh, this is just an aside I have to laugh St Andrews our friends over the road have got a little sign up saying messy church next Sunday messy church and my Josh perhaps, perhaps his cynical spirits come upon me now upon him now but we were driving home on Sunday and he said to me he said messy church Messy church, he said, I don't think they understand what messy church is. He says, messy church is when the Holy Ghost comes and messes things up and people are on the floor and crying and God's in the house. I said, yes, son, that's what we need to pray for, some messy church. But even though in that mess, and we spoke about that last week, where the strength of the ox, where there's no oxen, the manger is empty, but great increase comes by the strength of the ox. Even in all of that mess, I believe that God speaks very, very clearly. Very clearly. Isaiah 6 and verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying to me, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah is sees that incredible vision of God, high and lifted up. Revelation 1 and 10, I saw, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a voice like one of a trumpet. God does and continues to speak into our hearts and into our lives and we need to make room for it. We will always make room for the word of God here preached. That is our primary, primary aim and goal here. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 
We have to do that. But on a daily basis, I believe God wants to dialogue with us and to share his heart with us, whether that's through a dream or a vision or a picture or speaking quietly into our own hearts. You know, there's some, I've had some of the most wonderful times in my life, just me and God and my Bible. I don't know about you. I've read scriptures a thousand times and then that verse has come again and it's come like I've never read it before. And so, suddenly God is speaking to me. God is speaking to me afresh. And then God speaks to people sometimes through physical sensations. Um, I can't say that I've ever felt like Isaiah. He said, my heart throbs like a harp for Moab and my, and my very soul for Kiriz. I don't think my heart has ever throbbed like a harp. I'm not sure about that. But obviously the guy was stirred about a situation. Very, very stirred up. And in Jeremiah, he said, my anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. That's another sensation I'm not really seeking after for tonight. But I think there are times where God prods us, prods us physically. I don't know about you, but there, there has been times when I felt like my heart was bursting out of my chest, that I knew that I had to go and say something to somebody or go and say to put my arm around somebody and pray for them. And I felt because everybody else in the room was watching that I didn't really want to do that, but I knew it was God prodding me. Now, I don't think we've ever forgotten that word, Heatherball, have we? Some years ago, the, the prod from God. But I think he does that sometimes. And sometimes we, we actually feel the pain of it physically. It's almost like he's digging us in the ribs. Get on with it. Say something for me. Do something for me. Take a step of faith. Sometimes it's just a feeling or an impression or an emotion. And I, I think God stirs us. I, again, I think we, we box God up. But God knows us physically, emotionally, and in every way. And I, I think there are times when he, he touches our hearts and, and we become tender. And, and we feel that we should. We can't say that we've had a, a, a word in our ear or that we've seen a vision in the night, but we just feel that we should, you know. I don't know what prompted Rob on Sunday morning after we said we'd, we'd, we'd buy the motorbike to come up and say, let's buy it today. But I'll tell you what, I'm glad that he was, whatever was it, a prod from a God or a word from the Lord that he came and did that. Because now the pastor in, in Pakistan can drive around on his motorbike with his lovely Sensei Community Church crash helmet and put his diesel in for the next two years or so. Wasn't that wonderful that we were able to do that on Sunday morning? But whatever God stirs in our hearts, you know, and th there will always be room for that in our church. We're not going to let people run riot, do all sorts of stupidity. But I want you, if you feel prodded by God or stirred by God inside or outside of our meetings, to come and talk to us. Because when we obey God's voice together, as a collective, it makes all the difference. And that was a wonderful turn of events on Sunday morning. And uh, I rejoiced. In fact, I was telling a, a lady that I went to do a funeral visit for on Monday about it, and she began to cry. Will you pray for this lady? Her name's Rose. She has nobody. Her husband's died. She has no family. She has no friends. In fact, good old Glor's going to go with me to the funeral next Thursday. And I've told the undertakers, they're singing the hymns with me. They're going to stop in. She has nobody. I can't believe that. These people are absolutely everywhere. But as I, she was talking about her husband's love for motorbikes, and it was just a wonderful opportunity to go and say, you know, guess what we did on Sunday morning at church? And the tears began to roll down her face. She said, that was absolutely wonderful. So will you pray that God will give me and Gloria the opportunity to bring this lady to church? It's very, very important. We need to get prodded by God. And in Matthew, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. They were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. There was something that was birthed in the heart of Jesus towards these people. I'm sure he prayed. I'm sure God had spoken some stuff into his heart in the morning. But he was stirred afresh when, when he saw these people. It was a prod from God. He, he, he felt that they were like a sheep without a shepherd. This wasn't a direct word, but this was a whole sense of emotion on the inside of him. And I think God does speak to us like that sometimes, doesn't he? Especially when we see people in need. Our, our hearts begin to, to bur be burdened. And that's when we should say, God, what is it that you want me to say? What is it you want me to do? How is it you want me to react in this situation? I think it's incredibly important that we do that. Here's one of four. Paul said, I wrote to you much out of distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you all. He was stirred up on the inside. He got his pen and paper out and he wrote a letter. He may be God is prompting you to go send a text or write an email as you leave church today to somebody and say, look, I'm standing with you. God loves you. You know, I believe God's got something better for you. 
in the future. We need to be prodded by God. And let's not put it in little boxes. Because sometimes you say, oh, the pastor stood up and he said, therefore, therefore, verily the Lord would say unto you, we had a prophecy this morning. I don't take that. I think we've kind of made it a thing instead of being a prophetic people where God speaks to us and we allow his word to come through us out into other people's hearts and into our lives. And some of you have been equally as prophetic as anybody that stood up here and prefaces the saith the Lord by just sharing something that the Lord has whispered into your ear. And let me encourage you, do it a whole lot more. That's what will build up our church and draw people near. God speaks through his nature as well, doesn't he? The scripture says that nature itself bears testimony to God. And uh, God would speak in different ways. I know Sheila often talks sometimes about, but she'll often pray and say, she thinks about the little bird, and if God looks after the little bird, how much he's looking after us. And the Bible is full of examples where God points us to nature. And uh, you'll see time and time again that um, God can either speak through an earthquake, but sometimes he does, or sometimes it's just an earthquake. So again, we've got to be discerning. Is this the voice of God? Very, very important. Acts chapter 2. Suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a violent wind. The wind was blowing. It filled the entire house, and then there came the tongues of fire that appeared among them. There was clearly a manifestation of the wind. And uh, God was really speaking. You know, just like this wind is blowing into this room right now, you're going to blow out into the streets and into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria under the power of my Holy Spirit, and you're going to go and be my witnesses. God was speaking very, very clearly through a divine act. Psalm 18 and verse 6 and 7, I cried to God for help. From his temple he heard my cry. It came before his ears. The earth trembled and quaked. The foundations of the mountain shook. They trembled because he was so angry. You know, the psalmist is saying, God really shook the earth man, when I prayed. God really showed up. I've never had the earth shake for me either. I think that could be quite a scary experience. So that's not what I'm seeking after either. Exodus 3 and verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared before the bush in a flame of fire. It was fire. So all of these are natural manifestations, but all God speaking. And then we find this lovely story in the book of Kings. He said, go and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and the Lord will uh, pass by you. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in a fire. After the fire, there was a sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went down and stood to the entrance of the cave. And there came a voice to him. We've seen in the previous verses that we've read about in Acts about the fire and the wind and all that sort of stuff. But in this occasion, God did not speak to him through nature. He just spoke to him in a very still, small voice. So I think, you know, God can speak to us anywhere and everywhere. Marion will tell you, she even said to me a couple of weeks ago, she said, I'm going to give my testimony one of these Sundays. She said, I got filled with the Holy Spirit standing up a mountain, just looking at nature, and I began to speak in tongues. Isn't that wonderful? God can speak to us wherever we are. Ken mentioned it the other day. He said, you know, when he looked around at the nature, when he was at Mike and Mary's van, looked around and just felt the presence of God and the grandeur of what God is doing. God has got a wonderful way of being able to talk to us. John here has got a wonderful story, which at some point I'm sure he will share with us, about how God spoke to him and even put a cross in the sky in the clouds above his house. He only shared that with me the other week. God's got a wonderful way of speaking through nature. And you know what? He wants to continue to speak to us. So my final point really is God can speak to us through prophetic enactment, or I call this prophetic mime. I'm not big on this, but... The Old Testament is full of it. Sometimes God gets people to do dramatic things and we, we know it's God. And he often spoke to his Old Testament prophets this way. The Lord said to Hosea, go take a wife of whoredom, have children with her, so that the land knows that they're forsaking the Lord. Well, mind that, that's a strange picture, isn't it? Go and marry a prostitute. If anybody ever tells me the Bible is a boring book, you have never read the Bible. It's full of all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Uh, God often uses the strangest things to illustrate his voice to us. And then in Acts, the prophet Agabus came down to us. Paul said, he took Paul's belt, uh, bound it around his feet and his hands, and he said, thus says the Holy Spirit. And he begins to prophesy about a famine that is going to come. So sometimes God uses some of those pictures quite profoundly to us. Um, not very often. 
but sometimes he does. So I think God's got a thousand ways of speaking to us. I wouldn't say that was an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. I think the most important thing is to know as believers that God wants to speak to us and is speaking to us. Just from my experience, really this is in closing as well, um, I never tend to hear God's voice cold. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'll be driving along minding my own business and God will say something to me. But generally speaking, it's when I make time for God, he makes time to speak to me. I think that would be true of all of us. And, and I think that's why it's important, and sometimes on a Sunday morning you know that I will leave a gap and say, let's just have a little time of silence here. Because we want to give time for the Holy Spirit to speak to certain individuals, maybe one or two of us, to say something into the meeting or to read a scripture or to pray in a certain way. I think it's equally important in our own lives that we make time for God. I don't think I've ever uh, just jumped into anything that I would call prophetic from cold. I don't sit there watching the television and decide I've got a word of the Lord and just j jump up and prophesy over the cat or anything like that. That doesn't happen. But what does happen on many occasions is when I'm just praying in my own prayer time or I'm here at church, I don't, God just prods me to do something. And I think, again, we need to hear this. And for me, it always generally starts with a few words or a phrase which I launch out on. I think some of you have felt that you can't hear the voice of God for other people because you've been waiting for it to be so spectacular, you've missed the whole point. You've been waiting for a technical vision. You've been waiting for it to look like Warner Brothers. You've been waiting for these flashes in the sky and lightning. And that's not the way God ever speaks, is it? You hear the voice of the prophet. He comes to the prophet and he speaks in this very still, small voice. It's just this little prod, this impression, this whisper. And I think sometimes we, we, we dismiss that because it doesn't seem strong enough or spiritual enough. Listen, God doesn't have to shout. I always find that bizarre. When you watch, especially a lot of American Christian television, the preachers don't half shout a lot. Have you noticed that? Life is if everybody's deaf. If they are, they only need to get a prayer line and get everybody healed. But there's so much shout. Listen, Chris is absolutely right. In, in, in the ministry of delivering people, in the ministry of ministering to people in need, you don't need to make a song and a dance and shout it through a megaphone. And that's why, again, you've noticed on Sundays when we've had prayer times, often I've closed the meeting and we've continued the prayer ministry after the service because I don't want to make it a show. And sometimes as well, I love our musicians, I love, I love worship, but sometimes even that can be intrusive because people need to hear quietly the heart of God to them. And so while we're all singing, I can't really be sharing something that God has laid on my heart for you because you're not hearing me, you're hearing everybody singing. So that's sometimes why I dismiss the meeting. I think we've got to get more, more clever about that in ministering to people and just allowing God to speak to them very gently. I do believe in that with all of my heart. Sometimes it's a picture and a launch out, and sometimes it's a scripture that's just a springboard. I can honestly say from personal experience, I've never heard an audible voice, I've never seen an open vision, but it's never stopped me hearing the voice of God for myself or for other people. I want to say this as well, don't, don't be dismissive sometimes, because I think sometimes God just smiles and whispers something to us to see whether we'll just launch out. I will never forget being at camp with my youth group when I was 16, 17. And um, we were being encouraged to use spiritual gifts and we stood around in this little group and we'd all started to launch out a little bit and then one of, one of the, the youth said, in a very loud voice, I see a picture of a fish in a tree. I'm thinking, dear God, we've lost it now. We really have. And uh, he said, but you know what? The Lord's saying, that seems like a fish out of water, but we don't need to be a fish out of water when we're moving in these things because these are the very things that God wants us to move into. All of a sudden, we're all crying and we're praising God. Let's, let's, let's not try and make it all fit. Let's just God speak through us. We know when it's God speaking through us. So let's not be embarrassed or ashamed. Let's remember that God uses our individuality as well. And the way he will use you to say things is not the way that he'll use me. And that's why I believe we need to be a prophetic people because there are, that certain people click with certain people. And the way that some of you would help somebody hear the voice of God or just a little word from the Lord 
would be a completely different way to the way that I would describe it because he works through our personality. And it's a complete aside, but the scripture talks about the interpretation of tongues. Have you noticed it doesn't say the translation of tongues? Because the way that I will hear from God and deliver it will be a different way to perhaps you would. I might say to you, the Lord loves you like a strong tower and you can run to him and be safe. And, that, and then somebody else might say, the Lord loves you like a, a hen like gathers a chicks to a breast and keeps them safe. It's the same thing. It's a translation. It's not an interpretation. But the word of the Lord is exactly the same. And that's why it's important that you hear God's voice and you help other people hear it because the way you reflect God's voice into people's lives is an incredible thing. Your personality, the softness of your voice, or the boldness sometimes of your voice can make the difference to individuals. We all need to hear the voice of God. And God can use every one of us. Next time when we move into September, we'll be looking at using this gift more practically and judging prophecy. And indeed false prophets, because the scripture says in the last days, false prophets will come. And we need to understand what all that is about. But let me finish with this scripture. Let love be your highest goal. You should also all desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. So my prayer over the summer is that some of you will spend some time in asking God to speak to you personally as you pray. And that more of us will be hearing the voice of God in the context of our church. I believe God wants us to hear his voice daily, not just Sunday. I think it will change our Christian life. It will certainly change our witness. Because the more we become attuned to God's voice, the, more, the easier it is to minister to people, even non-Christians. Because we know it's God speaking to us, therefore we can jump out on it. You can take it to the bank, because it's God. And so I'll leave you with this thought. You need to be available and you need to create the time for this to happen in your personal walk with God. I want more and more to hear his voice. My sheep, Jesus said, hear my voice. Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, I just want to thank you for the wonderful, diverse nature of everyone that you have joined to this fellowship. And for the ones that have come from other churches, Lord, I just want to thank you for how you want to use us all. You talk about us being different parts and yet one body, different functions and yet one Lord, one spirit. And so I would pray that you would use us all in the days that lie ahead. I thank you for the key and core giftings that you've placed within individuals. I just pray, as we often pray on a Friday night, that the the gifts that we have will be manifest more and more. That you will just release people into their God-given purpose and plan here in this church and beyond. And so, Lord, I just thank you again for the freedom and the liberty to be able to open the scriptures tonight and the anointing that you placed upon me. And so would you bless your people. We pray again for Marion, that you would just bless her, Alison and Julian tonight in their, in their grief. And uh, bless Ray, little baby Josiah. Lord, all these people that we care about tremendously. I just pray that this summertime will be a great time for all of us as we endeavour to hear your voice more and more. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night and God bless you. Thank you for coming.